I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome to Real Ag on the Weekend here on 650 CQM and 980 CGME. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. And by the way, you should check out realagriculture.com and all the great content that we've posted throughout the week covering everything that is happening in the world of agriculture in Saskatchewan and Canada and beyond our borders. We're trying to bring all the information to you to make sure you stay on top of all of the issues that could be impacting your farm business. Today on Real Ag of the Weekend, we got a great lineup for you here today. We're going to talk about some of the crop conditions. We're going to look at the Saskatchewan crop report that has come out for the period between uh, July 16th and uh, 22nd, which is the latest that we have, I believe. And uh, yeah, hot, 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 hot crops kind of going backwards in some parts, which has a lot of you concerned. I know that. We're also going to hear from uh, George Gake today from Olds College talking about spraying with drones. There is somewhat of a disconnect between what the technology is capable of and what you are actually able to do based on the labels of some of the products that you may be interested in using a drone to apply on your field. So we're going to hear about that, and I've got some thoughts as well. We're also going to talk, speaking of the heat, we're going to talk about canola and heat blasts and some of the stress that the heat is causing to canola. We've got a recent Canola School episode that's brought to you by BSF Canada and Vigor Hybrid Canola. Uh, Amber Bell of Real Agriculture was talking to Justin Naniga from Alberta about uh, some of the impacts of heat blast. And then we're going to finish up with, uh, I'm sorry, we got to talk markets a little bit today. We're going to hear from Steve Nicholson of Robobank to find out what exactly is going on in that spring wheat market. It, it is like, it cannot find an identity. Some of the other crops, you kind of know what they are. Spring wheat is one that has just had a hard time figuring out what it wants to be when it grows up. So we'll get Steve's analysis of that today. Now, if you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also make sure you check out Real Agriculture across all the different social media platforms. You're also more than welcome to call that Real Ag feedback line, 855-776-6147. Yeah, well, crop report, mm, could be better. Could be better. You, you you look at things and, like, relatively speaking, we are better than we have been in past years. Okay, so we got to we got to keep positive about that. But if you know, talking to a number of growers throughout the week here, if we look at where we are today versus where we were four to six weeks ago, we're we're growing in disappointment because we saw what we had. Right. And I don't know how many growers have said to me, listen, um, if you would have talked to me three weeks ago, I would have told you a bumper crop. I can't say that today. Some people are, you'll move from above average potential yield to average. And some have even said, hey, I think we're moving below average in, in some parts. So the Saskatchewan government put out the crop report saying another hot, dry week has many producers worried about their crops, especially in the southern and western portions of the province. Multiple extremely hot days during the critical flowering stage of many crops has likely lowered yield potential in some areas. Producers are hopeful they will receive rain soon to aid with seed filling as harvest is fast approaching. You know, and just a bit of a side bend. Yeah, harvest is fast approaching. You know, I'm starting to see here uh, barley fields turning. They're they're showing color change. Uh, Report continues. There are a few reports that crops in the driest areas of the province, most mostly early seeded pulses and cereals, are close to being ready for harvest. There you go. See, just exactly what I just said. The persistent high temperatures and insignificant rainfall continue to push topsoil moisture backwards in the province. Cropland topsoil moisture is rated at 50% adequate, 40% short, and 10% very short. So, yeah, we, we've kind of lost our top end potential of this crop for sure, indeed. Uh, Earlier this week on the Real Ag Radio podcast on Thursday, I talked to Davidson, Saskatchewan farmer Mike Becky. Here's what he had to say about his crop conditions. They're doing okay. Um, I think it took some of the top end off of it. You know, the oil seeds are maybe taking a little bit more of a licking than anything. But uh, overall, uh, things are looking still pretty good. We can sure use the rain here soon. 
But we can't seem to produce a cloud. No, no. We sure can't. Um, it's been smoky here in all the last two, three days, so I've kind of saved us a little bit. You know, it hasn't gotten as hot as what they said it was going to. Yeah, you know, and in, if we've learned anything over the past number of years with some of the forest fires and we're dealing with smoke, it, it buys us some time until the next rainstorm. But, but the, the key is the next rainstorm's got to come. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't sound like there's really anything for the next while anyway. It's what I've, what I've uh, listened to, so. Yeah. Would you say that in those parts as you're driving around, the fields are still like that average? Or yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I'd say in our area, um, I think they'll you know it'll still be an average crop. Um, I think some of the earlier crops will be better. You know, the guys that got uh, seeding earlier uh, than some of the later stuff, but. Yeah, uh, I think I, I would say that seeding date, you know, in those early seeded cereals versus the later seeded cereals, we're going to see a big difference in the yield. I think so. Yeah. E- even in the canola, um, there's lots of canola around home that are flowering, and uh, a few guys that got in early, they're all potted and already, um, you know, been flowering for the last no oh, week and a half, two weeks. They're looking uh, pretty decent. Yeah, it's the if you were really early on your canola and you got out of flowering before, I don't know how much of that is even out there, but out, out of flowering prior to the heat, you're really laughing. But yeah, that's pretty few and far between. The majority of the canola is in flower during this heat. Yeah. And and you take the risk it's uh you know seeding really early, uh, getting hit with you know an early frost or whatever. But yeah. it turned out good for the guys that did this year. A- any sign of things like grasshoppers? Oh yeah, mm. been been spraying some grasshoppers and uh, aphids. Oh aphids, have they been pretty bad? Yeah. yeah, yeah, the numbers are starting to climb up there now. That was a portion of my conversation with Mike Becky, who farms in Davidson, Saskatchewan. If you download Thursday's episode of the Real Ag Radio podcast, you can hear that entire discussion, along with conversations with many farmers across the country. When we come back on Real Ag on the weekend, we're going to talk to George Gake of Olds College about the regulations around drone spraying. You're listening to Real Ag on the weekend here on 650 CQM, 980 CJME. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. I see on social media a lot of farmers doing some experimenting with some pretty cool technology. That's drones. We've talked about drone spraying for a long time. It's been a number of years. If I look on realagriculture.com and our YouTube channel, we, we can go back say, seven, eight, nine years. And we were doing videos about, you know, the opportunity, the potential for drones to be a real tool in the field. More so than just, hey, taking some really great pictures, okay? And one of those applications is spraying. But the regulations aren't necessarily in line with what the technology is capable of. Recently, Amber Bell of Real Agriculture caught up with George Gake of Olds College to talk about spraying with drones. 
Canada is a little bit behind other countries in the regulations that have been uh, put forward for allowing spraying with drones. Um, at this point, it's not actually a, a hold up with Transport Canada. It's with uh, Health Canada and the groups that approve uh, the use of chemicals. So there are health concerns still with um, you know, what happens with the, the spray pattern. Because as you can see from this drone, as an example, uh, the propellers are, are obviously pushing air down. And so um, there's not, there hasn't been enough research into the droplet pattern then from, from uh, the spray when you're using a drone versus say, uh, you know, a crop spraying plane. So that's kind of where the holdup is. Um, as far as uh, being able to spray, you can for research purposes, and Transport Canada is happy to to uh, help out with that. And Health Canada is interested in you know the results of that that kind of data. Um, but yeah, commercially, it's not um, it hasn't been approved yet. There's just I think it's actually a fungicide that has been approved, but not any uh, any chemicals like any fertilizer or pesticides um, that have been approved for that yet. We're hoping that you know it'll come along uh, fairly soon. Right. Um, one of the other, I guess, one of the other issues with it is that uh, to spray, you have to be very close to the ground. So um, it does take uh, a fairly large crew, especially if you're flying in an area where um, you've got hills and that. Because mm -hmm. right now, the regulations from Transport Canada say that you can't fly beyond visual line of sight. So if the drone's going over a hill, you got to have somebody on the other side of the hill to see where it's going and, and be observing and reporting back to the drone pilot. So, um, you know, that's one of the other holdups for larger operations. Right. Um, but um, like I say, we're hoping that, you know, it'll go further, get worked out. And, and we have also here at Olds College, we've been doing some research with spraying and and that as well and hope to continue. To do, more about do you know if there's a lot of research happening or is this still kind of people are just catching on? Where are we at with that? That's a good question. I'm aware of a couple of other uh, areas uh, or other institutions that are doing um, uh, research into the spray patterns and that. It is, well, as you can see, it's windy today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's part of uh, the issue with also with spraying and, and with uh, trying to research the patterns of that. Um, obviously, the, the uh, you, you have to start off with a completely... <laughs> no wind environment which is hard to do in alberta exactly yeah so that you can actually analyze okay so if there is no wind where are these uh, droplets going to end up and then you have to be able to once you've figured that out then test it out against windy conditions like this to see um what happens so i like i say um there's been a couple of other uh groups that we've talked to that have been doing research into it but um as far as i'm i know there's not like heavy um research being done into it right right now okay and do you have any sense of maybe how much it's going to take before because i know the states is slowly putting stuff out there you know do you have a sense of how much it's going to take before maybe our regulations will change and i know it's just a guess at this yeah. point. yeah um we were actually hoping for this year that, okay that they would have been finalized but it hasn't been um so really to be honest i have no idea I'm yeah i'm not exactly sure what the holdup is um, I know, like you mentioned, the U.S. also Australia is actually approving it for uh, even spraying along highways. So I mean, right for weed control there, and I'm thinking, wow, that's the wind there would got, be completely uncontrollable. And you've got drones, and yet they've approved right. it. Wow, and we're we're still we're not there behind. All in that. in some ways, though, it is um, maybe a good thing that Canada is kind of taking yeah. a more precautious yeah. stance on it, right? For sure. Um, you know the safety side that's that's always really what has to be important and when you're you know when you're talking spray drones then you're you're talking beasts much right. bigger than this yeah this one's actually small compared yeah, to some of the spray exactly. drones i've seen exactly. mm -hmm. and they keep coming out with bigger and bigger spray drones so um yeah not only are they bigger but then um you know they have to have a lot more power to be able to carry all that weight and they're heavier than with all that weight right. on them so um I can't say that it's a bad thing to to be very cautious about about uh, you know passing regulations for them. Right. On another note, though, drones have started to be used more broadly in agriculture for other purposes. Yes. So I know there's like geospatial data that's happening with yeah. it. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. 
before I go to that, but just something that t that ties a little bit to spraying or similar is um, drones. Spray drones have been modified for for planting, broadcasting seed. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's one where that that's okay to do, and it it I think um, shows some great potential for uh, farmers that are getting into having cover crops. Right. Um, so I've heard of farmers that are that are say they plant corn. And then they do some kind of other uh, cover crop um, in between the rows and that with, with drones, as well as areas that are wet. I was going to say low spring. areas yeah. that tractor so can't get you in. You don't want to get in there with your tractor and get stuck. So I've heard of um, farmers actually hiring, um, you know, drone operators to go in and, and uh, uh, broadcast seed in those areas so that it doesn't just turn into weeds once it dries out. Right. Um, for other things, uh, well, we'll start with this. This this drone here has a thermal camera on it, okay, as well as a uh, RGB or color camera. So um, we use this to create uh, uh, with RGB side. We we create a, a high resolution map, including elevations, so we can see cool. where the field is draining and where it isn't draining, etc. And tied to that with the thermal, then in the spring uh, after the snow is melted, the thermal camera gives us a great indication of where the moisture is in the mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. so we can use that to plan our seeding for the field um, we have as well what are called multi-spectral cameras so they have um, different bands that uh, that are captured by the camera than what we can see with our eyes in the in the electromagnetic radiation spectrum there so um, with those there's been a lot of research that's been done into what that what those other bands tell us about plants, uh, going back to the 70s, actually, and the, and the satellites that were first put up then. So um, you've been able to determine that you can basically uh, see the health of a crop and tell where maybe you need to do add more fertilizer or where you need to um, add you know some irrigation if you're doing that. Um, and so we use that actually for uh, prescription mapping. Okay. So we've got a uh, variable rate sprayer, which is another technology that is starting to really take off in, in agriculture. So we fly a field with a drone, create a, one of these prescription maps with um, our multispectral camera, and then load that into the sprayer. And then the sprayer actually puts on more or less of whatever we're applying uh, based on that. that and it all works map. together. That's works, amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. So kind of that. The dream would be to actually have that all automated where a drone just flies out on its own, does a field, comes back, you know, AI takes over and processes the data and creates a prescription map, sends that right. to an automated sprayer and out it goes and does it. And then kind of changing directions here, do you have a sense of where we're at economically when it comes to, let's say, purchasing a drone that can do some of the more um, geospatial stuff right are we at a place where it's economical for one producer to buy that or would it be a group of producers or just a company that runs it and operates it it, it depends on what they want to get so if you want a high resolution map of your field or of your pasture um then you can use uh like a little mini drone right and there's the technology is there to... and those are so decently priced at this oh, point yeah, that exactly. like everyone can have access yeah. to it basically the the big expense used to be uh, processing the data but now there's open source um applications which means they're free for anybody to use that will take the data and process it and create a uh you know high resolution digital map for you that was george gake of olds college you know a lot to unpack there obviously there's lots happening in the drone side of the equation but like as pointed out by amber and george there's other applications as as well uh, crop scouting, I think in a remote ranch situations, you know, getting out to see the animals, lots of exciting times and to see how they will be used going forward. But there is a lot of controversy and some issues currently right now about things being off label and potentially being sprayed through drones. So definitely need to make sure you know what you're doing and uh, probably don't post those videos on social media. Don't draw attention to yourself. Hey, when we come back here on Real Egg on the Weekend, we're going to talk about heat blast and the damage it's providing to canola. You're listening to Real Egg on the Weekend, 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. The next generation is the future of agriculture, but how do we launch from one role to leading? 
From succession planning and family dynamics to understanding finances and making the tough calls to discovering paths others have taken all through agriculture, the Successors Podcast covers it all. Tune in with me, your host, Kara Oosterhouse, simply by searching The Successors on your favorite podcast platform, or you can find it by visiting www.realagriculture.com. Real Ag Radio is Canada's only daily radio show focused on agriculture. Get expert advice on Agronomic Monday. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we'll cover a broad range of issues. Thursday, we'll hear from farmers across the country on the Farmer Rabbit Fire. And we'll wrap things up Fridays with the Real Ag Issues panel with Kelvin Hepner and Lindsay Smith. Join us Monday through Friday at 4.30 Eastern. And don't forget about the replay at 7 in the morning on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on The Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. With the high temperatures across Western Canadian prairies, it's it's kind of unfortunate that the timing of it is right during canola flowering. And I, I know for a lot of people who are listening to this in Regina and Saskatoon, you're like, oh, I love when canola is out there in flower. It's so beautiful, so yellow. Love to drive through rural areas of the province. Well, farmers love it too, but we like the heat, the temperature to be a little bit lower. Because in, it, when we have this high temperature, we get heat blast. And that's, we're knocking ourselves off of that optimum yield, like we talked about at the beginning of the show. In a recent Canola School episode, and you can find more episodes of the Canola School by going to Canola school.com it is brought to you by bsf canada and invigor hybrid canola amber bell of real agriculture had a chance to talk to justin naninga about the consequences of heat blast so i am standing here with justin naninga he is a director on the board of alberta canola and also on the canola council of canada and we're going to be talking today about heat stress and flower blast in canola so welcome justin it's fantastic to have you good to see you amber Okay, so we're talking about heat blast. Now, can you just tell me a little bit about that? Why would we be looking for that in our fields? So the reason we're looking at it is in the first two weeks of flowering is the most critical time for for heat blast. If we get too much hot temperatures, over 27 degrees, that's when the most of the damage is going to occur, is on that first two weeks of flowering on the main stem. Okay, and what are we looking for? What would be some signs and symptoms as we go in the field? Just flowers starting to come off, abortions off the main stem where there should be a pod starting to form, but it's aborted, it's just a stump. So at what stage of the plant growth is this the most critical and kind of what weather conditions are we looking for um, to keep an eye out for it? So, um, yeah, the first two weeks of flowering is is the most critical, Amber. Um, in that time, if we get temperatures over 27 degrees over or daytime temperatures, that's when we start to see some of that damage. What can mitigate some of that is if we get that cool evening temperatures that lower than 15 or around 15, that can really help reduce the amount of damage that we, we see. And typically we can see 10 to 20% yield reduction if, if we get too high of temperatures and, and lose some of that pod set. And we're kind of getting close to that now. What stage of the plant does it stop being as much a risk? Once the the pods are formed, um, it definitely reduces the the chance of, of of that happening because the pods are already formed. But saying that, with with the pods being formed, they, the seeds are just little water blisters basically in a pod, and they can be gone also. Like they can fry. Boils that boil water. Boil out. Yeah. So. Right now, I'm under the understanding there's not really a whole lot that can be done about it once you're at the point outside of managing your expectations for yield, right? No, there's been different trials of different products, but there's been no real, nothing that helps. We're just, um, just bear it and, and hopefully it cools down soon. And what about seeding timing? So, I mean, obviously it's a little bit late this year, but for next year, would seeding early be the way to go? Seeding a bit later? You know, what are your thoughts on that? 
typically that's usually our, our, our plan is to seed as early as we can, try to beat the, the July heat that we know is coming. But uh, the last few years, it doesn't really seem to matter. We've, or the heat has been coming at different times and we've been hit either way. So um, I would say that seeding early is still the best. So Justin, is there any ongoing research that you know of that's kind of going into helping growers manage this? I mean, seasons have been getting hotter, right? That's what we've been looking at, so. There's not been any real specific what does better with heat stress. Um, there is a little bit of work going on in the brown soil zone. Um, some work there. Uh, also, locally here with uh, Gateway Research Organization, some of our plots, um, we've seen some where some varieties did better than others, but we haven't done spent any time to specifically go over some of those. Gene editing, I think, will really open some doors um, to, to reducing the amount of impact that we see on some of these problems. So um, that'll be interesting, but I think those are a few years away. Right. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens as we go forward. And do you have any words of encouragement for producers in this flowering season? Go on holidays while it's hot. <laughs> There's there nothing we can do. <laughs> I like it. Uh, might be a really good time to go on holidays. Yes. <clears throat> it's one of the challenges there in the strategy. There's not much you can do about it, right? You, you can... You can try some of the products that are out there. You know, you're going to get, it seems like varying degrees of, of effect and impact. You could move your seeding date earlier. Now, a lot of growers have done this, right? They've, they've decided to seed their canola earlier to get past, you know, to, to get through the flowering period before the July heat really takes off. But we figured out there's a consequence to that decision as well, which is it's cool at that time. We maybe get a bit of a touch of frost. It sets the plant back, maybe even kills it. So that's the worst case scenario. We've got to replant. But let's just say it knocks the plant back a little bit. It, it extends that window for the flea beetles to then attack the crop. And then once they attack the crop, that stalls out the growth. And then it gives the flea beetles more opportunity to attack the crop, right? So the, what we've seen as of late is people moving that seeding a little bit later and just taking their risks on the heat, and so it's it's kind of, I don't want to say it's a no-win situation, but you're really at the mercy of Mother Nature. Whether you seed earlier or later, she makes the call on, on what happens. So it's, uh, it's one of those frustrating things. Hopefully there will be products out there to help maybe, you know, help the plant deal with some of the heat stress at flowering time. There's also new products out there. Uh, I think it's called uh, Parametric Insurance, where... You can take out insurance based on the temperature on your canola crop. Uh, I think GARS is one of the companies in Saskatchewan that offers that kind of a, a product. So that's something maybe to look into. So yeah, fascinating on just if we just don't have a solution yet. And that's the frustrating part. Okay, we'll be back with more here on uh, Real Egg of the Weekend. We're going to talk about something else that's frustrating. The spring wheat market. We'll be joined by Steve Nicholson of Robo Bank when we come back. You're listening to Real Egg of the Weekend here on 650 CQM and 980 CJME. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith of realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for The Agronomists, Canada's only live, interactive agronomy-based show. Each week, we answer your most pressing questions with a rotating panel of agronomists, researchers, and extension staff from across Canada. Join me Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or head to realagriculture.com slash live at 8 p.m. Eastern. You know, if the weather isn't frustrating you, the, the markets definitely will. It has really been a just a frustrating time in trying to figure out when to sell, when to take some of the risk off the table when it comes to this 2024 crop. 
A lot of debate out there about how big the crop is that's out there. We've seen in Western Canada, we've been talking about, we're, we're pulling back, I think, our expectations. But hey, if you look, the uh, Hard Red Spring Tour is happening in North Dakota. They're predicting the highest yielding wheat crop in North Dakota since like 1992, since they started that tour. I think it was like 54 and a half bushels per acre. So yeah, there, there is some crop out there, whether we like it or, or not. And the market has been trying to balance out all this information. So earlier this week, I had Steve Nicholson from Bank on the Real Ag Radio podcast. So if you, if you missed that, you can download Wednesday's episode or go to the Real Agriculture YouTube channel, okay? And I asked him specifically, what do we make of spring wheat? Here's what he had to say. I pulled up a December spring wheat chart. And, oh, sure. Okay. And I, I just got out, like, uh, what a roller coaster. <laughs> and, and, and a crop that clearly can't figure out what it wants to be when it grows up this year. You know, we're, we're sideways trading to the third week of April. Then that I, can, I can remember doing interviews with market analysts about that. You know, do we really want wheat to be leading the market higher, which it was, right? We yeah. almost get to $8, and then it makes the decision, you know what, let's go to 6 <laughs> And it bombs lower, cool. does a little bit of a bounce, bombs lower again. It, 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 almost, it pretty, looks like it does uh, trade a little bit below $6. And, and now yep. we're 6 34 and change. So what is going on with spring wheat? Yeah, I, I think it's, and I'm going to put it, spring wheat to me is always a mystery because I agree with you. This is a crop that there's not many places in the world that produce, you know, heart, you know, spring wheat um, and produce this sort of quality of spring wheat. And so, you know, there's not a big, there's not a big pocket, you know, there's not a big bushel basket full of it around the globe. So you go, you kind of sit there scratching your head and says, why is Minneapolis wheat going through the tube when you got not many people making, you know, Hard red spring or winter wheat around the world, yep. but I do think, unfortunately, what happened with wheat was, and and the fundamentals absolutely supported your premise of your question. I don't for any wheat crop because you had you had relatively low stocks, but you did see several things that caused wheat to have this dive of two dollars basically in spring wheat. Was you had a corn market that was sick and continued to get sicker, and so you saw it go down. You then had, you know, you also, you had issues in Russia, but Russia, you know, keep in mind before this was just dumping wheat on the world market and the world is like, it doesn't look like they're ever going to stop. And then you had the U.S. winter wheat crop continue to get bigger and it, and that's still the case today. And so, and, and at that time too, the market was like, you know, the wheat crop around the world looks pretty good. And so, you know, people thought, well, we're going to be fine. We don't, need to, we don't need to put a premium here in the wheat market. Now, we found differently once we got here is that, you know, yes, the U.S. winter wheat crop is getting bigger. The European, the Ukrainian, the Russian crop is getting smaller. You know, people, the, the Australian crop was basically flat. I mean, it was average. It was a good average crop. It wasn't what they had the last three years. Um, and the fact is, you, there were some expectations that we would see a, a little bit of a bump up in stocks which isn't really materializing when you look at the global market right now. But, you know, when I look at spring wheat, you're like, I agree with you. It's like the wheat market, still the fundamentals are still relatively favorable to be supporting to prices. But if you can't get corn price to have any sort of life about it, it's going to be very difficult to support wheat prices going forward, unfortunately, because you have this, and not that you should be spring, you should be feeding spring wheat, but then you have not necessarily in our part of the world, but other parts of the world, you know, that spring, you know, that wheat feeds into a feed ration. That's why we always start with corn because we, we yeah. need, we need corn to lead. If we're going to go higher, yep, we that's corn right. to lead that charge, right or wrong, indifferent. I don't care if you have, don't have corn within 50 miles of your farm or 500 <laughs> miles of your farm. You need to be watching that corn future because that's the indicator. Right. That's exactly right. And I, you know, I come from Iowa, which is a corn state. So, you know, I'm glad about that, but you're wearing, you know, you're wearing your corn pajamas at night. Exactly. I wore my corn pajamas and my corn hat going to bed at night. Exactly. But, but the fact is that corn is the lead of the complex and rarely does it give up that lead. And so it leads everybody down. It leads everybody up. And you did see, you did see, I, I said the same thing last winter. I said, we could be the leader of the complex here just because of the fundamentals. And it did do that for a bit, but it didn't do it for very long. And that's, and I think 
it's a reminder again that you know the, the because corn fits into so many pockets it fits into the food chain it fits into the feed chain it fits into the biofuel chain and also just the sheer volume and the you know all the and the liquidity of that market is what leads all the other markets up and down Unfortunately, the Friday close on uh, December spring wheat, you know, around 607. So not, not a great way, way to finish off the week for spring wheat. And, and quite frankly, most of the commodity markets, yeah, there was a lot of red on the screen on uh, Friday. Almost everything except for rice. Rice somehow the contrarian play when it comes to commodities sometimes. You do find that. I'd like to see the stats on that. But, yeah, a lot of red on the screen on, on Friday. And uh, this is a challenging market for you, the, the grower, to try to sort out how to properly market your crop through a really bearish tone period. And there were signs this week that, you know, maybe, 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 we were trying to find a bit of a bottom at these current levels, and then we decided to showcase the back end of the week that, nope, that's uh, not not here, not yet. So uh, good luck. And, by the way, we we put out Friday our July Real Agri Study survey that went out. Many of you probably got it. I appreciate you filling out. We're going to get an indication how farmers are feeling about the confidence in their marketing plan and as well the direction of the markets at a very, I think, important time as we're – very close here. Next week, we flip to new crop, right? New crop trade. So uh, important, important stuff. And if you don't get, uh, or you're not participating in our Real Agri Studies Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index, make sure you go to realagristudies.com or you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. I continue the conversation with Steve. A bit of a bonus here. Let, let's find out now about the U.S. election and the impact it has potentially on the commodity markets. Is there an election trade here for the grower? Yeah, I'm going to be a smart aleck for a minute. I said, anything I say today will change next week because we've it had is. so much happen in, in, in two weeks. It's like, no what kidding. else? Can pop? Yeah, so I, I need to pay that declaim, disclaimer up front. But I, I do think it's a, it's a valid question, something producers and traders need to be thinking about. Also keep in mind, there's a lot of protectionist talk around the world and a lot of protectionist trade moves around the globe. And you're also having 64 elections around the globe this year, which is unprecedented in time. So you have a, a lot of rhetoric. And once you get past the election, some of that rhetoric fades in the background. I'll use a couple of examples. You know, India, Modi was all over this and, you know, rice, you know, we're going to, we're going to ban rice exports or, you know, they pulled back on rice exports a year ago. We're going to do the same thing with wheat. And now the election's over. Well, we've lifted the rice export bans and, you know, a much different attitude. Same thing about, think about Mexican corn. Well, we're not going to take a GMO corn. Well, that, that talks kind of faded in the background now that their election's over. So I think you need to think that in mind. But from a U.S. perspective, I think we have to be a little bit concerned about which, who gets elected. You know, Trump has been very clear about, I'm going to add 10% tariffs to everything we import. I'm going to put 60% tariffs on China. And, you know, he hadn't said anything about, well, they might retaliate. Well, we know they were going to retaliate because they did in 17 and 18. And U.S. farmers have had to, have had to suffer through that. And we're still sort of suffering through that, that hangover, if you have it. But I think, you know, when I look at it from an agricultural perspective and all the protectionist movements, all the bilateral, trilateral trade, trade agreements, that doesn't help agriculture. Agriculture thrives in a more free trade agreement where everybody participates with the same rules. And when you have multiple different sets of rules across the globe, that makes it much more difficult for anybody. That is Steve Nicholson of Robble Bank. I encourage you to go to the Real Ag Radio podcast from Wednesday to hear that full interview, or you can go to the Real Ag YouTube channel. Hey, Monday night, agronomist, 8 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Mountain, so 6 o'clock local in Saskatchewan. Go to the Real Agriculture YouTube channel or at realagriculture.com slash live. we got the agronomist, Lindsay Smith, will be talking about straight cutting or swathing canola. Some great harvest strategies there for this canola crop. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening to Real Egg on the weekend, and we'll see you again next week. Cheers, everybody.